climate change is uh, real and important and significant. Cost of living and the cost of electricity are real and important and significant for families, most especially low-income families. So there is a right way and a wrong way to address climate change. The right way is through incentives which improve our ability as a country to perform both economically and to take care of those who are most socially in need. The wrong way is a massive electricity tax, a tax which is about driving up the cost of living. So what we have done is crafted a position for Australia which shows that we share our fair share, we do the right thing by the planet, we also do the right thing by families. To that extent, I want to briefly set out why uh, we have done what we have done, how we will get there, and what we are doing as a nation. And it's a story about which Australia should be proud. Uh, what this shows is Australia's share of global emissions. China and the United States clearly have the vast bulk of emissions. Australia is here, as Julie said, at 1.3%. This is a very interesting proposition, the idea that Australia has grown since 1990 through to now. Our real GDP uh, has uh, almost doubled or has doubled. Our emissions per person are well down and our emissions per unit of GDP have halved. That story is often not understood, that Australia has made massive strides. Then this is interesting. This is how we have closed the gap over on our 2020 target. In 2008, when the justification for the carbon tax was put in place, it was 1.3 billion tonnes, which Labor said we needed to find for the period between 2012 and 2020. Then before the election, in a figure we said was inflated, 755 million tonnes, then 421 million tonnes. Now the official figures are 236 million tonnes, but these figures are declining and we are on track to be in a position by Paris to show that we will meet and beat, meet and beat our 2020 targets. That then brings us to the post-2020. What we see here is the comparable countries of Japan at minus 25%. Uh, we have the United States, it's minus 26 to minus 28% on 2025. Uh, New Zealand, which was minus 25 for 2025 and then becomes 30, as is Canada for 2030 and the EU, when you do like with like, 34%. Uh, as the Prime Minister said, Korea, a uh, competitor and comparable nation in many ways, minus 4%, and uh, the growth in China will be about plus 150%. That then led us to our goal here, putting us fairly uh, amongst comparable nations of minus 26% and up to minus 28%. So a range, as with the United States, of minus 26 to minus 28 per cent. So you can see here that this is Australia, right in the middle, doing not just our fair share, but doing a lot of heavy lifting for the world. And I say that because, and we'll provide all of these materials, on a per capita basis, when you look at the same time frame, Australia is seeing a 50 per cent reduction. That is the highest of any comparable country. Australia's per capita reductions, and we do start from a higher place, as we go forward to 2030, are the highest of any comparable country, as is the reduction in our emissions intensity per unit of GDP. That then, I think, is important to understand. When you look at this in a visual way, there's Australia on a per capita basis doing more than any other comparable country, and on an intensity basis only matched by China in terms of our emissions reduction. So when people say that it is critical for Australia to play its part in per capita, we are. And in terms of intensity, we are. And then the, the last question is, how do we actually get there? And when you look at this, you see these are the reductions through the work of the whole of government analysis, which we've identified. First, this will be Emissions that we are buying now, emissions reductions from the Emissions Reduction Fund before 2020. This is what the Emissions Reduction Fund uh, and the safeguards mechanism will produce over the course of the decade from 2020 to 2030. It is our enduring and fundamental policy 
Unlike the Labor Party, which changes its policy literally every year, it's been our policy since 2010, and I fully intend, and we fully intend, it'll be our policy to 2030 and beyond. There's also, as outlined in the white paper, the National Energy Productivity Plan, the vehicle efficiency measures, uh, which will be developed, uh, the ozone and uh, fluorocarbon measures. Those measures are coming as part of the next round of Montreal Protocol and have the support of the refrigerants industry. But we are doing this without increasing the price of refrigerants. The Labor Party, in many cases, doubled and quadrupled the price of refrigerants and therefore had a huge impact on farmers, on dairies and on uh, small supermarkets uh, with their carbon tax. And here we have the other measures, uh, technology change, modelled on a very conservative basis, uh, carryover, because there is a very real chance that Australia will have a significant carryover, uh, and then other items which will uh, develop. We modelled to 26, and then we realised that there was sufficient surplus that we could go to 28. So like the United States, who will have a minus 26 to minus 28% target, theirs is 2025, ours is 2030. So what we've shown here is we can do this, and we do this without a carbon tax. The Labor Party has one big thing here. They have a stack of carbon tax. They have an electricity price. So the next election will be about a choice, reducing emissions in a way which can help Australia be part of the world task, but without a tax on families, or a tax on families, a tax on businesses, a tax on electricity. The choice is clear. We're doing the right thing by Australia, we're doing the right thing by the world, but we're doing it in a way which is responsible.